Mm -hmm. Okay. When I was a kid, I spent part of every summer at my grandparents' ranch in southeastern Montana. The Arbuckle Ranch was the biggest playground in the world, a place full of wonder and mystery, the complete opposite of the boring suburban street in Billings where I lived. One summer day when I was about eight, my grandparents took me to spend the day at the neighbors who had a boy my age. Kelly Corneman was a typical ranch kid. He was quiet but friendly, with a dry wit and a great sense of adventure. When I went to visit Kelly, I knew it was going to be a good day. On this particular day, Kelly asked me whether I'd ever ridden a calf. Of course, I said. This was a lie. But I was a Montana kid, and my dad was on the rodeo team right here in Bozeman, where I was born. He was even a rodeo clown until my mother made him stop when I was born. So I knew in that way that kids know things without any evidence whatsoever that I would be able to ride that calf like a real goddamn cowboy. <laughs> Kelly took me to the barn where he fixed me up with shaps, gloves, and even spurs. He fastened a rigging around the calf's torso and showed me how to tuck my hand tight under that rope. We guided the calf into the chute where I lowered myself from the rails onto his back. Kelly whipped the gate open just like they did at the rodeo and for about five seconds, I rode that calf like a champion. <laughs> but suddenly the calf stopped dead in its tracks and I went flying. The way I remember it, I was soaring through the air kind of like Jeff in his squirrel suit. <laughs> but I think I probably looked a lot more like somebody falling off a calf. <laughs> I landed flat on my stomach and my legs kicked up so that my spurs popped me right in the back. For the next 10 minutes, I was pretty sure I was going to die. <laughs> Kelly must have thought the same thing because he rolled me onto my back and he was crying like a baby. And then Kelly did something I didn't understand at all. He crawled down to my feet and started to pull my boots off. Kelly and I didn't know that his father, Donnie, was watching this whole scene play out from the barn, laughing his ass off. <laughs> so for years afterward, both of our families had a good laugh over the fact that Kelly Corneman wasn't about to let his friend die with his boots on. For decades, I considered this nothing more than a great childhood story, but I recently started to see it from a slightly different angle. I spent the better part of the last summer traveling to every county in Montana as research for my next book. And since then, I've been reading as much as I can about the history of Montana. And I came across a statistic that took me by surprise. Last year, Gallup did a survey to determine the happiest states in America and Montana finished number one. That wasn't the statistic that surprised me, though. What surprised me was another study showing that for the past 40 years, Montana has finished in the top five for suicide rate every single year. So what the hell? Are we happy or suicidal? <laughs> the answer to that question seems to be yes. But that leads to another question, which is how can both be true? I think the answer is simple but complicated. When the West was settled, our history was written by two kinds of people. The first were people who had an agenda. They say the victors write our history. And in our case, the victors made heroes out of sons of bitches and demons out of innocent victims. For decades, people swallowed this narrative because it made a damn good story. Plus, there was just enough fact to support it. Over time, that narrative shifted, but a legacy was created that's been hard to shake. The other faction that shaped our identity were the tourists. In the late 19th century, a law school friend of Teddy Roosevelt's named Owen Wister became enamored with the West. After a few trips out this way, Wister holed up in a gentleman's club in Philadelphia and wrote a novel about an Easterner who moved to Wyoming and became legendary for his cool demeanor, his skill in handling a firearm, a rope, and a lady. 
The Virginian was considered the first great Western, and because Wister was a talented writer, it's not hard to see why. But he also established a template for Western males that is absolutely impossible to live up to. Soon other outsiders came along to keep the myth alive. Zane Gray was a dentist from Ohio. John Ford was from Maine. John Wayne, whose real name was Marion, was born in Iowa, but his family moved to Los Angeles when he was a boy. The men, and yes, they were almost all men who shaped the Western identity, knew nothing about what it's like to grow up in this place. But for years, people in the West have tried to live up to the ideal. We are self-sufficient. We don't ask for help. We don't show fear. We don't get mad. We get even. We pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, a physical impossibility, and we get back on the horse. I left Montana for 25 years and lived up to my own heritage by drinking myself into a treatment program. Once I was sober, I came to understand many of the best and worst parts of growing up in the West. And it became abundantly clear that these twisted versions of our history have done us a disservice. A lot of people say, why can't we just move on? We didn't kill anyone. It wasn't even our ancestors that did that stuff. But here's the deal. Because nobody ever talked about what really happened, we all repeat the same old patterns. Although they certainly got the worst of it, it wasn't just the Indians who suffered. Statistics indicate that the people who settled the West struggled just as much with depression, loneliness, and fear as we do today. One look at the number of saloons that sprung up in every pioneer town, and it's not hard to figure out how they dealt with that stuff. So with this new book, I want, went to take on the Montana narrative and get it, give it a good solid kick in the ass. I don't believe these mythological people that were created for our entertainment ever existed. I don't believe that these people got through life without help from others, and I don't think that we should be expected to do it either. So today, 50 years later, I can stand before you and tell you without shame that I never rode a calf again. <laughs>